Dr. Wally is a professor emeritus in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at The Ohio State University in Columbus. Uh, Dr. Wally is an ecologist by training and he and his associates and graduate students have conducted research in the Western Himalayas, the Danish, uh, Danish woodlands, the Canadian boreal forests, the mid-continent of North America, and the Eastern Temperate Deciduous Forest. His work has been on vegetation and the environment relationships, on reclamation of disturbed systems, and more recently, on the impacts of global climate change. I've been in the field for many, many years, and uh, perhaps Dr. Nick should have pointed out that I am known more for longevity because I lasted in this field for many decades. So what I'm going to do, since I'm a firm believer in truth in advertising, is to tell you how I got there, and in fact, I have shortened the uh, time period to only 45 years, but please remember, that no angel on this God's earth can complete a 45 year history in 45 minutes. <laughs> so the word charitable is very, very appropriate here. Now, I thought that perhaps the best beginning of this lecture would be with the earth rise. This particular earth rise occurred, as you probably know, in 1968 on a very auspicious day, December 24th, 1968. And uh, Carl Sagan, one of the world's leading astronomers, suggested and called it the pale blue dot. He said, from the heavens, you don't see any humans. Here resides all the life on a bunch of rocks and some metal. And uh, then something happened that was very unusual, just four years after this earth rise. There was a United Nations conference on environment, the very first one in Stockholm, Sweden, also referred to as the St Stockholm Conference on Environment, and this took place on 12th June 1972. Please see that some of the people thought that uh, the earth has become like the windshield of our cars, but nothing to worry about. If you use chem wipes or windshield, you can clean it. And so uh, that's where it stayed. But this particular conference did a remarkable thing, which many of my colleagues in the academics do not remember. It gave us the Stockholm Declaration of Environment. If any of you have forgotten it or not seen it, please do. And just about 16 years later, National Geographic came up with this first catalog of a holograph. And this holograph showed that the Earth was shattering into bits. It was very strange. In 16 years, the whole thing changed that fast. Whatever was happening. And of course, Time Magazine, not to be undone, a month later, had Planet of the Year, like Person of the Year. And the Earth of ours, as you can see, is properly placed in cellophane and tied by a jute rope. And when I saw this cover, I said to myself, what are they going to do for the encore? Because person of the year they can find. Well, you get the point. And of course, in 2010, and every year for the last 10 or 15 years, we are having conferences on junk in space. 19,000 pieces hurtling at a speed of 30,000 kilometers an hour up in space. Several of the satellites, German, British, European, and American, have been endangered. So what happened? In a mere, just a blink of time, from 1968 till today. So what we did was, there was a tremendous renewed effort on what we were seeing. We were seeing a large number of problems. The burgeoning human and livestock populations, land use, conservation to cropland, rangeland, fertility loss, deforestation, degraded air and water quality, diminished loss of resources, ocean acidification, 
loss of biodiversity, gender bias, climate change. I, I put this in yellow because to me, and now there are more and more ecologists who agree with me, the number one problem of the world is loss of fertile land. And all over the world, China, India, and of course the United States, and what the global climate change is going to do, it's going to exacerbate it. We're going to have problems, and I'm going to talk about this toward the end of my lecture. And so here we have a confluence of battles. We have a war, and uh, we need solutions if we talk about sustainability and sustainable development. I just looked at the World Cat, and there are some 14,000 books on sustainable development. Amazing. Do they say something? Not really. <laughs> and uh, when we talk about all of these issues, I say battles are won by generals. Wars are won by statesmen and stateswomen. This is a very important thing, because as I'm going to point out to you, there is a big difference between the science of ecology and the science of environmental science. So what happened after the uh, Apollo's Earthrise photo, this picture that was shot with a Hasselblad camera, and that is the greatest gift of scientists to all of humankind of the 20th century? Well, at that time, the president of the United States was a very imposing Texan by the name of Lyndon Baines Johnson. He was a remarkable president, by the sir tells me. He was the one who gave the voting rights but he changed the complexion of the United States of America with reference to black America when he said three words in his Texan draw, we shall overcome. And his contribution to environment was no less. And this is why I have quoted him here. He says, we see that we can corrupt and destroy our lands, our rivers, our forests, and the atmosphere itself all in the name of progress. Such a course leads to a barren America, bereft of its beauty and shorn of its sustenance. And this is an address to the United States Congress. But he said, we see that there is another course, more expensive today, more demanding. Down this course lies a natural America restored to her people. The premise, the promise is clean rivers, tall forests, a clean air, and a sound environment for man. Well, was this just talk? Or did he do the same thing for environment as he did for voting rights? He surely did. My research tells me that he changed, modified, and introduced new laws, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Wildlife Act. He uh, gave orders for about 30 federal lands to be preserved for, for not only posterity, but for as biological diversity things, because he was truly amazing. I actually removed three or four slides that I had initially put in it to show you his contributions, but then I thought that perhaps I didn't want to Americanize the audience, which wasn't my intention anyway. But along with all of that, in 1967, his Secretary of the Interior, issued a report which is very germane to us here. And this report was not a scientific report. It simply talked about surface mining and our environment. Amazing. And it's, it's uh, one of those things that had tremendous number of pictures showing what mining had done in the United States. It showed that there were about 3.2 million acres that were disturbed, a one and a half mile swath all the way from New York City to San Francisco. And this is what got us started in reclamation. Suddenly, we became conscious that there was something wrong with the environment. Now, before I get started, I want to tell you something. Ecology is a science. It really doesn't matter whether there are dinosaurs on Earth or the human beings. Because the science of ecology will go on. And what it says is that, if I just give you the principles generally, it says everything is connected to everything else. 
So we have the climate, the soils, the, the plants, the producers, the microbes, the consumers, and so on. And as I tell my students repeatedly, the only producers in the world are not Chrysler and General Motors and Ford and Bill Gates. It's the remarkable compound that you see in green plants. Chlorophyll. That's what drives this world. Although Robert Solow, got a, the economist from MIT, got a Nobel Prize for saying that technologic, for his technological thinking and thinking that natural resources are not important, I haven't heard that Professor Soloff has started eating plastic. <laughs> so we have got this whole matrix that is interconnected, interdependent, and all these things have dimensions that they share. They share laws of thermodynamics, very important, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in the Arctic or the alpine environments, the grasslands, the deserts, there is, and for ecologists particularly, the second law of thermodynamics is very important, which says that every time you convert energy, you are going to be losing some usable energy. And this is where my difference with the economist comes. Ecologists do not have a term called gross primary productivity. When you look at a tree or a grass or a cactus, that particular plant has paid its price for living. It has lost 60% of its energy in respiration and such. And so what you look at is net primary productivity. And that's the difference. No ecologist in his right mind has ever talked about gross primary productivity of the boreal forests or gross primary pro productivity of the tall grass prairie or whatever. Please remember that. That's very important. And of course, these two ideas and the very important thing about these processes is they have a space-time relationship. You cannot throw money at something and buy time. No way. So, and there are, once you study, like this particular international school is here in, in Edmonton, under the direction of Professor Bates, you understand the processes and you try to generalize you try to generalize what uh, the process is and what the pattern is. And so you don't have to go every time and just rediscover the wheel. If you have studied semi arid systems in Alberta, they're as good for India or anywhere else. But, of course, there are specific species that live in a particular environment. So after you know the principles, you try to tailor it to site-specific conditions. And very importantly, this whole thing is very complex and it's multidimensional. It is irreducible. It has got a lot of unknown me mechanisms because we haven't studied them for long and there is a lot of uncertainty. And this is to be expected when you have a multiple variable determined process. And in the background of all these processes, are the humans. Now, I, ha I carry a lot of baggage. I was a student of politics and a student of history. And so uh, I was really amazed when after that disastrous episode of 9-11 in the United States, there was an article that came from George Will, who is a noted conservative columnist and a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. He said, trains, taxes, all are related. This article came out in Washington Post. When I read it, I really like how he writes. What he writes about is what I have problems with. So uh, if Dr. Will, who got a PhD from Princeton in political science, we had taken uh, the beginning course from him on an ecologist, he would have known that planes, trains, and taxes have always been related. And they will continue to be related so long as we have this world as it is. Now, one of the things that I have had a problem, I give uh, lectures to, to lay audiences, I mean, I don't mean unintelligent, very intelligent audiences who are not trained in sciences. And one of the problems that we have 
is we cannot convey this, this feeling of the time factor. And so when we have a lot of snow in Edmonton and somebody is working on global climate change, probably you have heard somebody yelling, hey, Mike, is that global warming? So uh, things in ecological systems do not occur overnight. And to prove that point, let me show you here, let's go for a random walk and look at the distribution of, uh, of American chestnut. Once upon a time, the chestnut forests were there from Maine to northern Georgia. They went all the way to Indiana. Fantastically beautiful forests in 1905. The foliage was green, like this. And then, of course, the tragedy struck. There was a crate of plants that came from Japan bearing a Chinese pest, a Chinese fungus called uh, Cryptonectria uh, parasitica, or what is now known generally as the Chinese chestnut blight. And pretty soon, the, the blight put these holes in the leaves and lesions on the trunks. And in 45 years, this is what the chestnut forest looked like. So please, whether you're talking to a politician, a statesman, an industrialist, let them know about this time factor. Ecological processes are slow. And this is a big difference between ecology and environment. When we talk about environment, we are talking about a totally human-centric thing, where myths and methods and morals meet. And, but that's not ecology. When you talk about Mother Earth, that's environment. Because ecology and ecological processes power the dinosaurs, and by God, believe me, it would have no problem powering us. So. Let's go very quickly and see what we're talking about. We're talking about disturbance to the environment. We're talking about something or some things that happen that alter the relationships of organisms in their environment, whether plants and animals or both, and both in dimensions of space as well as time. Now, because of widespread disturbance and changing land use, our world's number one environmental problem, therefore, over the last many years, Academics love to do this, they spend terms. We have got a whole lot of terms. When I was young, I would protest. But now that I am old, I don't fight mnemonic battles. I tell my students what they mean, and then I tell them to go ahead and use any way they want them. But do know what they mean, and I don't have time to go through all of that. But reclamation, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and restoration are terms that are being used very frequently. And some do not like that. They call it remediation. For example, the microbiologists like to use the bioremediation. Uh, so does our uh, United States Defense Department. And for some strange reason, in the last five or 10 years, I found out that plant physiologists prefer the term bioremediation. And I have no idea what that means, but it means the same thing. And uh, there are other ridiculous things uh, that I heard. <laughs> at uh, UNESCO conferences and international conferences. It's probably to hoodwink the poor, unlettered farmers and such. They use the terms development, redevelopment, eco-development, and you get the idea. Now, but how much <coughs> of the world is disturbed? Severely, moderately, just a little bit. Really, is it true? Who knows? <laughs> Who, what graduate student in his right mind would behave like an accountant and go around looking at the thing? You know, how much of the world is disturbed? And by the time the th thing is done, there's more that has been disturbed. Because humans, according to a paper that appeared in the Bulletin of the Geological Survey of America, disturb about 75 billion or 75 gigatons a year, far greater, twice that, that the nature does. So 
there are so many estimates, and everybody's estimate is as good as any. It depends. Uh, by 83, United Nations Environment Program says that we, we had severely disturbed 2 billion, two billion uh, hectares on a dam. And uh, another study also for UNEP suggested 3.6 billion. The Tusik, uh, Peter Wittusik, a good friend from Stanford University, says one third to one half of the earth is disturbed. Um, Acharya, a lady who works for the World Watch Institute, wrote a paper uh, that said that the Canadian forests are destroyed one hectare every 30 seconds. Uh, Russian boreal forests at twice the rate of tropical rainforests. My good friend, who uh, chose not to come here, and <laughs> could somewhere else, Dave Schindler, writing a paper in bioscience, said that there's a dim future, that's the title of his paper in bioscience, a dim future for boreal waters and landscapes. Uh, Global Consequences of Land Use is a paper in 19, 2005 uh, science from Jonathan Foley. Jonathan Foley is a leading authority on, 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 uh, on land use. He has worked with another fellow for many, many years by the name of uh, Naveen Ramankutti. And Naveen is now a professor at McGill. And uh, the CEO of uh, World Wildlife Fund said that tropical forests are lost at 25 hectares a minute. And uh, just in the editorial of the latest issue of the Frontiers of Ecology and the Environment, Raman Kuti and Ram Tula from McGill ask the question in an editorial, can intensive farming save nature? The pressure to convert land is unrelenting. And uh, BBC, on, from 21st to the 27th of October, that's last month, had a whole series in Africa. They treated each of the country separately, Madagascar, Mali, and on and on and on. So, but we know that the world is losing productive land. The food prices are 10 times that of the level of 2000 when compared to 2011. And this is going to go on and on and on. And so, let me make one other suggestion. Only the human populations are not to blame. Something else has happened when you look at human activities. As we changed, to, in, to mechanized farming, we harvest crops, and in the process, we leave a lot of food on the ground. This is picked up by birds as they migrate to Canada. <laughs> it's, it's really remarkable how these birds, losing all the pressure of food, have started multiplying. And they go to the largest, one of the largest wetlands of the world, the, the Hudson Bay Lowlands. And this particular slide shows lesser geese that uh, were about less than a million in 1950. But uh, in 1998, there were 3.5 million birds. <laughs> so you say, I'm a bird lover. What's the matter with you? That's OK. And I say, no, it's not OK. Because this is what the birds do. This is grazing by birds. And this exclosure shows what the vegetation was like in Hudson Bay Lowlands. This is from the excellent work of the late Bob Jeffries at the University of Toronto. And uh, there are a number of papers from him, as well as from his group, Abraham et al. are still at Toronto. And I would highly recommend to Professor Nate that they should hook up with this group, pardon the pun, it's intended. <laughs> so, fly north, anyway. And uh, one of the problems with when areas lose vegetation, over time, this particular plant, which I've studied for many years, for those of the for those who are botanists in the room, it's glasswort, Salicornia europea or Salicornia rubra. And this is the only plant in the world, it's a cosmopolitan species, 
that grows in high salt concentrations. It can draw water against the highest osmotic gradient, <coughs> and that is what happens to these areas. Okay, so this is what's the degradation like all over the world. I won't waste too much time. And imagine what happened in October last year, 2011. We in the world are now a mere 7 billion people. So the question, what is the perfect gift for the planet's 7 billionth person? Answer, clean water and adequate food. And I thought this would be an excellent time to make a brownie point with Anne. So I said, <laughs> the answer also is reclamation. And uh, so it's very important that we look at this. Now, I almost accidentally fell upon this project that, that I'm going to talk to you about. I was a pure scientist. A pure scientist is defined as one who does the prestigious work that does not any, in any way profit humanity. That's why physicists write these big equations that nobody can understand. And they are the most prestigious. There is no Nobel Prize for environment. I, although uh, Mario Molina and Sherwood Rowland got it for CFCs, but that is, that's a real phenomenon. Anyway, so this is, this is what I found. Uh, somebody gave me a tour of this, uh, and I always did not like, after having been a forest ecologist and having done my doctoral work on boreal forests in Canada, incidentally, for those of you, uh, I was almost directly in line west of here from Edmonton, just a few degrees north latitude in, in British Columbia, where I spent many, many months uh, during the summers. Uh, I was in McLeod Lake, where I had half a logger's cabin. So it was very interesting digging soil pets and uh, coarse tree cords and such. So I happened to go and accept my first job in North Dakota, and I really could not take it. It was too flat. Until I saw a site like this. Brown, lesser brown, more brown, gray, green. And I said, oh my god, what's going on here? And it looked like Dolly Parton's coat of many colors. And I said, now there's got to be something that is determining these different communities, and these are the micro relief features. And so after looking at these, this is an abandoned, these are abandoned mine sites, I thought to myself, gee, it would be nice to do an ecological work on ecological succession and see what Mother Nature is able to do with, with these abandoned spoil piles. So an ecological project was born titled The Systems Approach to the Reclamation of Surface Mine Areas in North Dakota. And so we got going. It was a multi-year project. And it included four conceptual areas. Four areas. The first, the ecosystem concept, which is what I showed you in that basic basic lesson in ecology that everything is interconnected and so on and so forth. The second thing we were interested in is ecological succession. For those of you who are not ecologists, ecological succession simply means change with time. It's a universal phenomenon. You don't have to believe what happens at the end. The fact of the matter is that everything changes with time. A third thing that we thought was very important was what Hans Jenny in his classic Factors of Soil Formation called the Environmental Formula. This is a book that was published in 1941. But uh, also, Hans Jenny had a very bright student by the name of Jack Major, who was a professor of botany at uh, UC Davis. He uh, also was my external doctoral external examiner, and later on a very, very dear and esteemed friend. He was more a mentor than a friend. And what Major said in a classic paper that was published in Ecology titled A Functional Factorial Approach to Ecology, he said that the very same factors that are responsible for the development of soils are exactly the same features that are responsible for the development of vegetation. And he was the first one to use multiple regressions the absolute first one to use multiple regressions in ecology and with great success. So what we thought of doing 
was to look at these abandoned piles and see what we can do. And if we can back this up with sensory modeling, we had a, I had a contract with Bill Parton at Colorado State University, not only on modeling, but also some animal studies that I'm going to touch very briefly on. And so I thought, here was an excellent way of looking at these areas, because the Yeni major environmental formula included the concept of succession, the, uh, the ecosystem concept. And Jack Major added another factor to it, and that is the Pydic factor, factor of fire, very important in North America. And one of the things that we thought we would be able to do is to resolve relief factors, topographic factors, and the factor of time. This is something Hans Yeni, I met him once only, wanted very much to do, and uh, I had almost uh, finished uh, a bit of this work when I, when I visited with him. That was my last meeting with him. But Jack Major, of course, knew exactly what we were doing. And so the idea was to look at how the change takes place in relation to those factors.